guys. Good evening. Let's level on in. Should all be drifting in now. What a day to have a webinar. What a crazy day. Many of you are probably watching the recording. Uh, get that. Okay. Let's uh, let's get cracking. First of all, let's you know, listen. Heavy day today, right? Well, we're down a thousand points or so on the Dow. Nasdaq's getting absolutely slaughtered. Um, you know, while the disclaimer's up, this is a good time to say if you are in a situation where things haven't gone your way today, it's a really, really good time to say, okay, what went wrong? How did I approach the day? And what were the big things that impacted the challenge of today? Because, you know, uh, like you, when I see this, I get excited, right? Normally, I go to the gym in the morning, I come back. So I wasn't there for the actual CPI number. I was going to come in, come for the open, prepare, see what's happened at the open. So when I came in after the gym and I drove back to the office, I saw the CPI just a blitz race the market. My instant reaction is, ooh, market's moving. You, we, as traders, we have that impulse, right, to volatility can seduce us. We get the feeling like, hey, I want to get involved in it. But the key thing is to change how you think about it. You know, you instead of going, you get the initial feeling of, oh, 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 oh you know, excitement, excitement, it's moving, it's moving. But you step back and you go, okay, that means opportunity. That means opportunity to potentially run some trades longer. It means there's a supply demand imbalance, a new catalyst. Okay, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to pick out the right trade like a sniper and execute. And that's a very different frame of mind I've got now to the frame of mind I would have had, say, 15, 16, 17 years ago, where I'd see something moving and go, oh, I need to get involved in it. And this maybe resonates with you a bit. You come in, you see something, you make an initial judgment on where you think the market's going to go, right? You come in, you see volatility, it's downloads, it's got to bounce. You know, whatever narrative, you just make that judgment and then you go, right. Then you start to add all the evidence to cement that belief. And what we don't do as traders and what it takes a while to kind of get used to as traders is to go, hey, hang on a second. I need to look at this in a little bit more clarity. You know, very often we can look at it and go, oh, it's got to bounce or it's got to go lower or whatever. We have that snap judgment. And then what we do as human beings, we end to reinforce that by looking at the evidence. It's this, the CPI number is this, it's down below the support, it's this, that, the other. And we reinforce that initial impulse that we'd had and the idea that we'd had. And that's dangerous because what we really, and that, and that creates impulsive trading and it can happen during the trading day. I'm just using, using this as an example because it's a great day as an example. Big repress scenario, horrible move just out of nowhere, caught swing traders out who were along on that rally. Lots of stuff's gone on. But as day traders, and many of you are day traders, this is a day trading club webinar. We can get seduced by that, but it's better to step back and go, right, there's opportunity. That's good. I need to think of the risk. I need to think of the best trade idea. I need to be calm. And if you need to sit out and just let the market adjust and get its rhythm, then fine. You know, and, and have your idea. and Look to stuff to reinforce your idea. Come up with your roadmap. But the key is just to allow the impulses. And I was excited. I came and I saw that CPI number, looked on to see what's going on. I was like, ooh, excitement. But you just let that dissipate and then go back into the professional mode and not executing from excitement of, I'm going to get money, I'm going to make loads of money, executing from a risk manager's perspective and say, hey, how can I take advantage of this? What's the trade I can position for the mo position for the best? How can I maximize the most out of the idea? What's the secondary idea, third idea? So for example, hey, I want to get short on a little pop at the open. Let's see if it fails and rolls over, we'll push it to new lows. Great first idea. And if that doesn't happen, what else have you got? What about later part of the day? Are you going to trade the latter part of the day? Are you going to you know, run the trade? It's just this, this planning and thought. And I know that it's just the the impulsive, seductive nature of volatility that catches so many out. And guys, you know, that you feel it still. And But before I would go, oh, market, I come straight to the desk, swing in and just click, click, click. I say, it must be along because of X, Y, Z. And then you're stuck and then you're, you're kind of bogged down on this. And it's a vicious cycle where, you're reinforcing that, maybe you're adding to the trade, maybe you're just getting stopped out, you're taking another go, you're doing this, you're doing that, and it's just a mess. You know, so realize the opportunity and recognize the emotion. We're going to feel the emotion. Someone put a great post the other day in the, in the Trader's Mastermind Forum. Uh, I think it was Bradley, shout out to you, pal, you may, may be listening. You know, what about how do, how do sort of seasoned traders think? And something I'd said was, well, I still feel excitement. I still feel frustration if I do this. I still feel like, oh, I can't seem to trade anything at the moment. But the difference is 
is that I shrug it off and I don't let that affect my execution. I might feel like, hey, I've not had a great run, but I know that for the last 20 years, I've always done better and recovered that run. And there's nothing to think that I wouldn't carry on with that. So it's just this different frame of mind. So anyway, I wanted to say that today, while it's crazy, um, if you've not done as well as you'd like today, if things haven't gone your way, it's a great opportunity to stop, reflect, and see exactly you know, what's happened. If things have gone your way, again, stop, reflect, mark down, your, mark up your chart, and see what you did right and what you could do more of next time in the future. Okay, so guys, disclaimer, you know the rules. Not rules, but <laughs> uh, this disclaimer. Um, and, and it's worth mentioning, look at the gap we had on CPI. I've got the chart on my left-hand side on one of the screens. The gap was huge. And there's no excuse for being caught on a number that you know is going to be a big number. Everyone's talking about CPI, so just watch out for kind of this headline risk at the moment. Make sure you're out of position because no matter who you're trading with, if your stop is in the middle and you're going to get a massive slippage and you're going to get uh, take more of a loss than you wanted to. All right. So this uh, webinar, ladies and gents, Day Trading Club, again, another episode that we're doing with Pepperstone here. Uh, discover your true trading edge and a stoic, stoic quote that I like to add, make the best use of what is in your power and take the rest as it happens. So from a trading perspective, wow, these guys, one of these traders, were these guys day trading from tablets years ago, like stone tablets probably not. But it's the same kind of thought of like, okay, in my power is my risk control. How much prepared to risk on the trade? How much prepared to risk on the day? How many times I take? What am I, what am I doing? I can't, I can't uh, control the market. The market will do what it wants to do. I can try and align with the market. I can allocate risk capital to a trade idea. That's pretty much all I can do. I can execute it within the best I can, but apart from that, I can't do much else. All right, we're going backwards. Let's talk about trading edge. So I want to challenge you. This is going to be an interesting one. You're, I think you're. I think you'll love this one. I think you're going to go. You know what? This is a real interesting one. Um, and I kind of when I write these slides together, I thought, you know what? Do it. This is the real world stuff. You guys want to hear real world stuff. You don't want to hear regurgitated things of patterns and all this type of stuff. There's a time and a place for that, but you want to hear. Okay, stuff that's going to help you, and I think is going to help you. So I think the next 40, 50 minutes, um, you're really going to enjoy this one. Uh, so I want you to think differently about edge. Okay, we talk about trading edge like, a, oh, is it this, is that. It's not your technical analysis skills. It's not your ability to predict market direction. And it's not your risk management. And you might be thinking, and, and, and some of these things uh, that I talk about in the next you know, 40, 50 minutes or so, they might sting a bit. You might be like, what the, what's he talking about? But, you know, the reason I say some of these things is because uh, it comes from the right place. It comes from, you know, a place wanting to help you guys and trying to share with you some stuff that's, that's been effective for me. And you're going to take a little bit, you discard this, you grab that. But if it kind of helps you improve, then that's, you know, the point of the webinar and why you're kind of spending a little bit of time with me today and why I'm, you know, writing these slides and putting all this stuff together for you. If I can just help you a little bit, move forward a little bit more and the next one a little bit more, a little bit more, you're ahead of the game. Okay, so um, to me, trading edge is this, and maybe not as succinctly and as eloquently as somebody who's more, you know, can put this better, but to me, it's it's what I call a skill edge or an observation edge. So I've always thought of it like this, of as I need to become very, very good and the best at this, this skill. So something you're skilled at relative to other participants, because we're trading against massive amounts of people, right? But all we've got to do is just have a skill that's better than the most, the majority, should I say, or most, and that's going to help us improve. That's not enough, though. We can't just say, oh, I'm great at reading tape. I'm great at buying exhaustion flushes. I'm great at kind of trading this particular pattern. I'm great at whatever it may be. You, you, that's fine, and we do need that, but we also need and this is where I guess I think is interesting, a unique observation that we've discovered in the market. And we'll dig into this more. But, but recognize this, guys, that everyone pursues technical analysis, risk management, psychology. And we absolutely need those. We need those. We need those. We need to understand the structure of charts, supply, demand. We need to obviously we need to have risk management in play. We need to be on, on board of psychology and how our emotions are affecting our executions and all this kind of stuff. We, we need that. But that's almost a given, right? You, you, everyone's doing that. Everyone's a great technical analyst. Everyone's putting out lovely, beautiful charts, all this structure. And yeah, great. That's, that's nice. I like it. But that's not enough. We see this. We see great technicians that don't have enough. And in fact, 
in the recent podcast, which is about to go up, Traders Mastermind podcast, I uh, spoke to Tom Hugard. And Tom Hugard, who's, if I've got his book here, there it is. Tom Hugard wrote this book, great book, recommend it, Best Loser Wins. One of the things that he said, which was very interesting, was, you know, thinking differently to everybody else. And this is something that all traders, we all think this, we all have to think about. He was thinking about it from his perspective. I'm not spoiled the book, definitely go and get it. Um, but he was talking about it from the perspective of, of risk management, adding to trades and from that and that angle. Um, I'm kind of generalizing a little bit. But, you know, as traders, we have to. If we look at you, the stats are there, guys. You know, go back, you see the stats, right? We want to be different. We don't want to be doing what everyone else is doing because we're just going to get the results the majority are getting. And you can see the stats there. Okay. So, what do we do? We are, everyone's pursuing technical analysis. Everyone's pursuing risk management. Everyone's pursuing psychology. But we need to think of our edge. We need to have this skill edge and observation edge. And you know, one thing that really um, I want to talk to you a little bit about my journey in, in looking at trading edges. Okay, um, because these are things that really help me move forward throughout the years. And I say these because I, especially this first kind of edge that really helped for me. It was only a few years into the market. So that maybe resonates more with where you are now as opposed to someone who's got a couple of decades under his belt. You're like, fine. Okay, that makes sense. So my first, you know, trading edge, if you like, was and let me tell you this story. So I um when I kind of got into trading, I decided to go and do a course in London. Right. So there wasn't the internet was there. It makes me sound like a dinosaur. The internet was there. Yes, there was stuff on the internet. If you were downloading from Napster, remember that? <laughs> you guys were, were back in the day. Uh, the internet was there, but it wasn't big. Right? You didn't have courses and you have all this information. It wasn't easy to access and it wasn't all this kind of stuff it is now. If you wanted to learn, you had to go to London and do a course. So there's this day course in London and it was held by this technical analyst. And there was about, I don't know, 15 of us in there. So it's quite an intimate little, little venue. Um, you know, fair price. And this guy was talking to me about technical um, technical analysis. An analyst. Te he was a technical analyst talking to me about technical analysis. Uh, so charting, basically, you indicators and stuff. And I remember the one thing I remember was coming away from that thinking, and it was this one indicator, for some reason, just stuck with me like, wow, I'm going to make so much money from stochastics. <laughs> I have all the indicators because they oversold and overbought. Wow, I mean, this, the description of it sounds so good. And funnily, you know, I've heard other traders say stupid things like that. But, you know, I thought this was the key. All I've got to do is find this and the right settings and this, that, and the other. And, of course, the guy meant well. He was teaching about charts and support and resistance, and it's all stuff you need. But, you know, I ran with that, and I realized pretty quickly that that is not going to cut it, right? I, I can become the best stochastic expert in the world, but – you know, it's not going to give me the, the opportunity. I need to be a bit, of, something else needs to be there. So what I kind of looked at was, yes, I built my the structure of how I construct the charts and how I read charts and supply demand, all this other stuff. But I started then to look at, um, and I've, I've told some of this story before, but we're getting somewhere, you know, stick with this. I started to see that, hey, the mining shares were very, very active at the time, UK mining shares. And I started to see that the second tier, what I called, i.e. not so big, not so liquid shares, would move a little bit later than the primary ones. So the primary ones would say move with the market and they'd be chugging up, you know, a couple of percent or whatever it was, not quite that much back then. But so I would then jump on the second tiers and they would kind of go after. And you're like, well, that's just so simple. Well, yeah, this, this, is, what, this, is, this is kind of the point. It was so simple. And I was like, is this, how is this possible? And that went on for ages. It was such an active sector. Everyone was piling into these first tier miners. All the people on bulletin boards are trading Extrata and Rio and Bulletin and all this stuff. And I was just trading these little ones. And yes, they were a little less liquid. And I could trade them because I wasn't trading, you know, institutional size. So that was my edge and the fact they were moving a little bit later. So it was great. I could trade this and I kind of developed a structure for that. And I looked at it and I was like, man, this is doing really, really well. But it's so simple. I was like, yeah, but... Everyone, you know, I've read books by then. It's, trading should be simple. It makes sense to have this complexity with all these stochastics and all this kind of stuff. It was something I observed and something I created and, and built on. And then another thing was the early algos on level two. I've definitely talked about this one. We you know, would have algos that were just reloading 10K at a time, 10K at a time. The market would be falling through the floor and this this one stock would be holding up. And you'd see it, you'd look at level two. And it'd be 10K, 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 10K reload with like 7,402. And you'd know that was the end because they were very, very primitive algos back then. And I spotted that and used to take advantage of that. You used to see that on level two and then trade via a spread better or CFD. And then we had time of day patterns in Dow and DAX. You used to call them names like Mr. 3PM or Mr. This and Mr. That. And it would just be this 
this movement of we you'd often see a move in a direction at a certain point in time. And so you could position for that more on that in a moment. Then I was spotting iceberg orders on the on the price lattice, which include all these, again, these kind of primitive algos. And these were all observation edges, right? This is look how different these are. These are the stuff that kind of move me forward the most. And this is well different from I was trading uh, you know, channel break and this and that. There's nothing wrong with that stuff. You need that stuff, but you have to have an extra bit of observation as well. Kind of want to talk about really today is this, is that the, and we'll talk about how we how we spot these things and how we kind of build this edge is finding something that's simple, but something that's effective and that you've spotted that other people haven't. You might be like, Mark, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. All this stuff, you know, it's been and gone and la, la, la. Yes, but there's something happening all the time. It's just for us to uncover it and find it. Um, and then, you know, if we move to the skill side of edge, I got good and I still think it's one of my strong points. I think I'm very, very good at it. Is aggressive trading under reprice momentum conditions. You know, so when we've had a reprice, when we see a lot of people running out of a very small door or they're stuck or whatever it is, you know, I feel like that's where I thrive. That's where I can really get aggressive, where I can outsize, where I can really do some damage and uh, in a good way uh, in the market. Ability to great trade, something I've worked on. I felt that's a skill edge for me. Um, and ruthless ability to cut losers. Everyone must have that edge, right? We all just must have the ability to cut losers. I'm uh, going back to uh, you know Tom on the on the podcast and he said exactly the same thing. In fact, all traders say it's not even Tom, even uh, other traders we've we've had on have said exactly the same thing. So oh I want to tell you about this about books like a book review webinar. Not really, but uh it's got this one ready. This one real nice book guys Pitbull Marty Schwartz. I recommend it before but for something that you may not have heard me talk about on page 91. Uh, I'd definitely go and get it. I'm not going to kind of repeat what's on there. But what he had done is what he did is this. Is he, and this is very similar to some of the stuff that I'd spotted and helped me move up the ladder of trading. You know, he'd spotted something similar. And he'd spotted and he's documented this an edge in the bonds versus the SP 500 price. You're like, what? That's the most simple thing ever. Yeah, but he, he was there and he made 1.4 in a month trading just that. And he says in the book, and go and read it, it's, a couple, it's nothing, nothing on Amazon. He admits it was luck to find the edge. But the point is, he was putting in the work, being there, studying the market. No different to me saying, well, it's luck that I've seen the fact that the second tier miners are just a bit late and using the first tier as a proxy. Yeah, but it's simple and it, you have to be there to, to, to extract it out. And the skill for, for Marty Schwartz was sizing up, waiting for the right opportunity. Times he would wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And then when he saw it, bang, he'd put a big position on. And it was a certain way he would trade it in a certain time of day. He would look for this thing. And, and it was, you know, it made him a lot of money because he was leveraging up and he was aggressive with the right opportunity. Um, and, and so it was a skill edge of being able to size up, waiting for the right opportunity, combined with the observation edge of noting how the bond market led the S&P. Notice this is not the fanciest chart. He's like, hey, Bonds have done this. I buy S and P. Simple. This me. First tier miners are up. I buy second tier miners. Very very simple. But it's effective if you find the right one. Is it lasting forever? No, lasting for a month. Made one point four. He was done. And they, they, they don't last forever. But this is the kind of thing that is the separator. If you can be at the screens or you can be studying, and we'll talk about how you kind of spot these type of things. It just changes the game. And this way, I want you to think differently from. Technical anal anal analysis. How many times am I going to mess that word up? Technical analysis and all this other stuff. It's it, we need it. Structure fine. We absolutely need it because we need to understand what's moving the market, supply demand, and this stuff is valid, right? But there's got to be more because everyone's doing that. Everyone's good at writing up a chart. Do you know any trader who's been in the trade in the business for more than six months who can't draw a decent support level, who can't draw a channel, who can't understand how moving averages work? Everybody gets that. But to get to the next level, we have to spot extra little edge. Um, and you're saying, okay, yeah, Mark, 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 that's, that's fine, pal, that's fine. But these edges are very specific things. They aren't repeatable. And you're right. You're right. I'm sure the S&P bonds 500 pricing is completely different now. I'm pretty sure the second tier miners thing has been absolutely hammered by the algos. They'll be on that. Algos in the level two are far more sophisticated. I know because sometimes I watch and see if there's anything fresh there. That's done. It's gone. But if you reframe your thinking and you're focused and putting in the work, you will spot something. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be huge, and you're going to say, this is the most thing ever. I'm going to make 1.4 million in a month. This is an example, an extreme example. He's prepared. He had the capital, everything, and stuff like that. But if that just helps you, and you go, hey, I've spotted something, a little pattern here that people may have missed, 
you can add that to your observation edge. So things like a time of day bias, a market correlation, an unusual behavior, you know, a, a, a specific price pattern that, that that seemed to work, you know, very well. This, you've got these type of things. Um, and I want to uh, actually, do, this is something I wanted to mention. Let's talk about this. So the other day I posted this on the, this is in the Community and Traders Mastermind. And it was just a kind of casual observation. I've noticed that there was, you know, for the past eight, 10, I think it was 10 days now, I think it's, it's um, it might have broken slightly. It was not have the con continuity, but notice there's a, there's a eight, eight o'clock to late five. There was a green bar, eight of eight so far. And the chance of that quite slim, like it's tossing heads eight in a row, if you're going to say 50, 50, even on a heavy down day. And so, you know, this is something that can you take advantage of this? Talk about how we take advantage of this stuff in a moment, how we spot this. But this isn't this is not huge, right? I'm not saying, oh, look at this thing. You've got to do this and buy at eight o'clock and put the remortgage all your assets and put it eight and close eight or five. No, no. But this is my the kind of way that you um you know you observe. And if you're in front of the screen or if you're printing off charts, you're marking up stuff, you go, hang on a second, why why is that standing out? Why is this doing that? And we'll talk in a moment how we take advantage of that. I mean, you've probably got some obvious ones in your mind, but it's it's a little bit more to it than that. But and by the way, this is hypothetical stats using just literally me eyeballing for the past eight days. And even something else, one of the other members, Chris, uh, a great guy, maybe listening, Chris, he said, hey, there's something else I've noticed also in NASDAQ. You know, this sort of time, there was, if we sold at three o'clock and bought back at five past three is UK time, um, you know, w w there seems to be some opportunity there. And, and I kind of crunched the numbers through this little tool we've got and said, yeah, you know what, is it a, is it a back, is this, is this proper back testing a strategy? No, it's not. This is just saying, hey, listen, this is something that maybe if you spot it early enough and you say, hey, four days in a row about this, can I, can I use that to my advantage? This time of day edge, can I, can I trade with that? Can I buy a little bit earlier? Can I buy on the time? Can I do this? Can I use that? If I know that there's a good chance, a higher than 50% chance of it being up in the next five minutes, I appreciate it's a very small time frame. appreciate this is just a really crazy example. But this is the sort of thing that you can spot every day, right? You can see this type of stuff. Even the overnight edge, right? The overnight edge, you've got um, the many investors aren't even aware of this. The majority of the S&P 500 returns occur at night. So for a day trader or a swing trader, we you know if we're in a bull market, I would work a while ago, buying at the close and selling at the open is actually a you know, fundamentally decent strategy, you know, getting and very many times of some stats done and saying, hey, for the past quarter, it's just like literally you lose money during the day. And then you can use that and say, well, does that mean I need to be short in the day? Maybe it does, you know, but this is the type of stuff that, yes, this is perhaps as not as clean and cut as nice as the pit bull edge or the second tier mining edge, but this is stuff that's different. It's the stuff that people aren't looking at. Who else is going back and looking at the three o'clock to 306 or 305 bar? Who is going back and looking and saying, hey, well, in 10 days in a row, we've had this weird one candle that's just stuck out. And that's observation, right? That's not me going back and doing some sort of number crunching. It's me sitting in front of the screen, marking up a chart going, that's odd. Why do we have that big green candle going down to the x-axis and saying, hmm, actually, you know what? Well, that's the top of the hour. That's the bottom of the hour. Let me go back and, and, and I'm kind of digging in because I've kind of seen some of these patterns before. So some other edges we've got. Um, Power Hour, you, many of you guys know this. This was something that was there for ages. We had this big tech run, people would just buy. And this is the Reddit crowd were doing a lot of this. So maybe some of you guys have come here from Reddit. But a lot of guys are making a lot of money just buying like strong stocks like Tesla in the final hour of the day, Power Hour. And that's something that they took advantage of and they were making a lot of money from. Unfortunately, a lot of those guys didn't have the extra skill edge. They had the observation edge, but didn't have the skill edge to go with it and manage the risk and recognize when that had broken down and it wasn't available anymore. So you had this kind of disconnect a little bit. Noon Balloon, I want to tell you about Noon Balloon. Um, this was interesting. Many years ago, 10 years ago, is it? Maybe that's, that's, that's sort of order of magnitude years ago. Probably more, actually, to be fair. Probably more like 30, 40. But anyway... I went to Vegas and there was um, I was meeting with a guy who was running a trading firm there. And I went in and he said, you know, listen, come in. We've got some new tr uh, some new kind of guys in here. Uh, you can sit in if you like and just sort of listen. And I think I was going there to, to, to give him business uh, to uh, kind of trade with him. or I can't remember why exactly. But anyway, the point was I was sitting there with the juniors, as it were, and I had a bit of experience. And I was sort of listening to what he was teaching or the teacher. There was a couple of guys teaching these traders. And they weren't talking about marking up charts. They weren't talking about this. And this is something that I see with literally all prop firms, guys. 
D was teaching him something that was working now. And this was a noon, what called a noon balloon, which you'll get every now and then, which is when there's an uptrend, is it just has that one final press into noon before often it just consolidates and disappears. And he gave some sort of reasons why that might be doing it. But the point was how to take advantage of this little pattern. This isn't technical analysis. This isn't stochastics. This isn't Bollinger Bands. This isn't stuff, which are all useful tools. This is, hey, I've spotted this. This is how we capitalize on it, guys. And this is how we do it. Uh, I'm going to say gang and guys. They're sounding weird. I, I meant to say gang and guys, but this is how we capitalize on this. So it's this, and the same with like the guys in London, right? The guys in London years ago were trading uh, interest rate futures spreads across the German two, five year, 10 year, I think it was two, five, two, five and 10 years, I think. And they would have this opportunity and they would capitalize on that massively. And that was their edge. And they were trading this little thing until one guy called the Flipper, I think it was called Flipper, Paul Rotter, his name was, going to read up on him, recognized that all these traders were trading the same thing. And so he came in with size and would trap them and make money from that. So the edge disappeared. And literally, you could probably mark on the calendar, the prop firms slowly died out because some of them some of them reinvented themselves and started to find different edges. That was just a huge edge that was working for them. So the point is, is guys, that you know, when we talk, why are prop guys are prop making so much money? Why are they doing so well in prop firms? And we see this type of stuff. It's because they focus on what's working now. They look for observational edges. They say, hey, there's a funny thing happened here at noon. We see how can we capitalize on this until it stops working? Let's put money behind it. Let's cap the risk, but let's keep putting money behind it. Money, money, money. Let's push it hard, hard, hard. And they are looking for these new things. So noon balloon was something, and very often we still get that actually uh, to a certain extent. So like from between a you know, quarter two and a quarter past. So it's not always on the button. So it wasn't like, okay, I just sell at noon and go down the pub and come back at the close and see how much money I've made. No, no, you know, it's just some more structure to it. But very often we do get that trend just pushes right into noon, last little flush, and then it kind of dies off a little bit. So often if you're buying there, it's too late. And if you're long, you want to wait for that last little push. These little things are observational. It's not, it's not structured and and stuff that you're going to see uh, traditional technical analysis is something that you have to observe and watch and kind of chat to tra other traders about and say, hey, I've noticed this. Have you noticed this? Yeah, I've noticed that. Okay, I'll look at that. Thank you. That type of thing. Turn around Tuesday. Um, again, these these edges range from really decent edges that you could probably trade quite aggressively as an intraday trader to, you know, stuff that kind of holds true and maybe you can leverage on it. And if it starts to happen, maybe you can add to your position and stuff. Turn around Tuesday, great one. Often we get you know, selling gap down on Monday, rotten Monday, and Tuesday would be a rally. We had this for a while, and I can't remember what year, but it was, it was almost like clockwork. And so you could wait for that flush of the open buy. It was Tuesday, check. You had to know that the chances of it being a, a kind of a, a red to green day on a Tuesday was high. You knew that this, that, and the other. So you could structure that with your skill set, with your observations, and go, hey, I'm going to come to buy a Tuesday. Uh, overnight session, high, low. There's a good chance of it hitting that. This is kind of observational edges, statistical edges. What happens after an outside day, your day two stats on that, your first 15 minute range, how far does your range go, probability of doing this, that, the other. This is observational type stuff. You know, often we used to have this scenario in the first 15 minutes where in the market would just, just flush with the floor, just flush, just like, Bleh. and everyone would like, oh, sure. But if you watched it, you recognize that when it did that, very often it would just come to a halt and then just go, boom, V-shaped reversal. It would do it all the time. And so you could then align and go, hey, I've seen this. What I've got to do is wait for the last candle, and I'm just going to buy on the, on the first green after that complete vomit of, of bias. You know, this is kind of, it, it's simple, right? It's simple, but this is where you can make gains and where you can, again, it's not recommendation. It's not for me saying do this, but just be a bit more observant in the market. What's the response to a trend there? Response to a flush candle in a five minute? All this stuff in Santa rally to some, to some extent. Uh, I put that in there kind of for a bit of a joke, but, you know, this is the stuff that is, it starts to align the stars in your favor. You know, what's the response to a flush candle on a five minute? Do you often get a pull back up? All this type of stuff. So these small edges come and go. The bigger themes often hold true over time. And, you know, you, you, I urge you to kind of find yours. So uh, th these aren't, you know, these aren't in a textbook, right? This is not stuff that's in a textbook because it doesn't, it doesn't always work. You know, it kind of comes and goes. And, you know, these are things that you see and you observe and you can't spot them unless you put in the work. And this is the, I think that this is probably, you know, one of the things apart from the psychology and discipline aspect of stuff, which is challenging. But once you crack that, so to speak, not only you don't feel emotion in trading, but you're more in tune and able to recognize you. Oh, maybe I'm feeling a little bit urgent about trading. Maybe I'm FOMOing into this. Maybe I'm a bit nervous, all this type of stuff. So 
um, you know, it's it's spotting these unless uh, you, you're putting in the work and putting the screen time. And if you can't put the screen time in because you're doing other stuff, I appreciate that. It's you're doing your homework. So mark, print off your charts, mark them up. Look, both Al Brooks, who was on the Trez Mastermind podcast a while ago, said that. Tom Ugard said that. Everyone does it to a certain extent in a different way. So, you know, and I said it here, pro traders are meticulous about this. So, you know, print off your chart, mark up, look, see, top of the hour, bottom of the hour. Is something happening at the top of the hour? Is something happening at the bottom of the hour? What happens after we get kind of sell off? And so, you know, we, these little structured things and little patterns that aren't, you know, they're not something that it's always going to be there, but it's something that might be a structure now and a rhythm now and a sequence now that you can take advantage of. You know, this is the edge to, and, 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 the, and I guess the point of this, guys, is to really, um, you know, make, make you think in a little bit of a different way or to consider thinking, I'm not going to make you do anything, but maybe consider thinking about trading. Just, just, just change the, the lens slightly, you know, rather than, you know, I'm going to try and get this thing, I'm going to try and get that. It's like, okay, wh what can I see? Can I see something? It's an observational edge that I see there's just a pattern of behavior that seems to stand out. Because if you can find something that's going to stand out that little bit, then you can run with it while it's still there. And if you've got your risk managed, you've got nothing to lose in a way. You're like, okay, as long as it's structured, my risk is managed. If I think that that hour is like a really strong hour, then yeah, maybe I should buy at the bottom of the hour, put my stop in and see if I can, okay, uh, how do I make more from that? Do I add to this? You know, so you start to then go, and then it starts not working. Okay, well, actually, I've been stopped out a couple of times now. I'm not going to give everything back. But I've also observed this. I've observed that. So it's observing the market. It's why I think it's very important to become, you know, a specialist about the market you trade. And you might not trade that market. Maybe you've observed something in the queues or the Nasdaq. You're saying, "Hey, listen, this is something often happens." But actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now trade the strongest stock in, in Nasdaq 100. I'm going to trade this or I'm going to trade that, and you kind of take it to the next level. It's thinking. How can I be better than everybody else? How can I do stuff that other people aren't going to do? How can I find things that other people can't find? How can I be ahead of the game? How can I be a front runner in seeing stuff as a small retail trader that is quite happy having a 10-minute candle that goes his way every time he spots something? That's more than enough for us. That's maybe not enough for for most of the big boys. That's not enough. Sure, some of the algorithmic funds may be, may be trading that. But even then, if you go back and you read uh, The Man Who Sold the Market, uh, even he, uh, Jim Simons, talks about, um, you know, sometimes they couldn't they couldn't um, capitalize on an opportunity that they saw. I'm not comparing this to Jim Simons, but they couldn't capitalize on an opportunity they saw just because there was no way of being able to get the size on. There was no way to you know, trade that without completely negating or being caught out. So you know, you might think, well, the you know, this, if it's moving at a certain time of day every day, isn't someone going to grab that? No, not necessarily. You can be the person who grabs that. You can say, hey, look, look, this is moving at this time of day, or this type of pattern happens regularly. I see it. I'm going to trade it and, then, and and kind of work in that. So more on that in a moment. But let's go to the skill edge. She found this repeatable pattern to trade, right? You found it. You go, hey, I've seen this pattern. Uh, we, we get this spike up at a certain point in time. And, you know, it's not something that's, it's simple, it's easy, but it's not something that's, that's overly complicated or technical. But you know, how can I trade this? So now you've got to work on your skill-based edge. And you've got to say, which slide one? Sorry about that. Uh, which, uh, we've got to work on our skill-based edge. So you've got to kind of audit yourself and go, right, what am I good at? Because what we do want to do here now, we've got the, let's imagine we've spotted something that's interesting. That's often not enough you know years ago there was a guy um a couple of I mean, a friend used to kind of chat on skype and trade some of these things together and we'd spot different things and, and this other guy came in and he's like hey we know what he's a friend of his and he's like yeah you know we've spotted this we're trading this they couldn't see it you just couldn't see the edge like it's there look this is what we're doing like oh yeah but you know what if this and what if that so you you still have to develop your skills to complement any observation you've got so you have to say hey are you good at spotting short-term supply demand imbalances are you good at adding to positions? Are you good at patience waiting for the right trade like Pitbull was? If he'd have taken every single trade, he'd lost money, but he was patient waiting for the right time. So, you know, this is, you're trying to develop these things, sizing up in the best play, something that, uh, again, Tom Ugard was, was talking about. So what is your trading edge? And if you're not sure, this is the kind of steps to tease that out. You know, so you've got your, let's say you're spotting observations. You're seeing, you've seen something and like, okay, that's interesting. I've noticed that very often, you know, we tag the overnight high, we reverse from that, 
maybe the V, whatever it may be, or the time of day I'll go, or some sort of structure or something that's just, hey, you know what? When there's a bit of a weird correlation between Apple and so and so, not talking about Apple and Nasdaq, obviously these things that are obvious, but you know something might maybe interesting, right? And this up to you. This is why I can't. You know, you need to find it yourself and go, hey, I trade, you know, GGA or whatever it is. And funnily enough, it kind of trades when we get a European close to the downside in the stock market, that often pops a little bit. You know, very often, we, you know, talk about another one we used to get, your futures, if there were futures were closing on high, talking about US futures, YM, uh, the, the bell would go 9 p.m. UK time for the stock exchange to close. The futures would just flush lower. For a while, they were doing this, and then they creep back up. So, Obvious edge for that was just to buy after that flush lower and let it kind of creep back up. Now, sometimes, of course, it'll stop you out, but the majority of the time, you get a decent trade of it. So just watching all these little nuances. So anyway, let's take a deeper look. What's your skill edge? Is there something you are exceptional at? You might be not really exceptional at anything. That's okay, because we're going to build that. You can build that. And I want you to ask this. I want you to ask this honestly. Are you just playing the same game as everyone else? Because if the answer is yes... I don't think you're going to get the results you want. If you're looking and you're saying, hey, I'm just doing, I'm pretty much doing the same things as everyone else. I'm marking up my charts or I'm drawing, you know, pretty lines on my charts and there's nothing wrong with this, but that's as far as I'm taking it. And I'm looking for this and I'm waiting for that. I don't have a really skill edge about adding to trades aggressively. I don't really have a skill edge about spotting some exhaustion pattern. I don't really do anything exceptional. I can kind of draw charts and make them look really, really good, but that doesn't really transfer into momentum with my account equity. And so that's often the blunt thing you've got to look at and go, I need something else. Where do I look? How do I kind of progress now? Where do I move things forward? So I want you to, uh, I want you to I think this is a good idea. This is the kind of thing that I think helps you move forward is to do an audit. And say, right, if I believe what Mark's telling me, I think, okay, if I can find some sort of pattern that's repeatable and I need to get good at a skill, because sometimes, by the way, sometimes that pattern may not be there, it may be nothing, and you have to rely on this skill in the normal times to push you forward. Like, hey, there's nothing really standing out. But I kind of noticed a bit of a structure in terms of, you know, when we get momentum, we pause, we pull back, and maybe it's a bit more TA type ish, but your skill then allows you to leverage on it more. Okay, well, I'm very good at getting aggressive on that. I'm very good at kind of dialing up the size and really building a 10 to 1 risk reward, so risk reward ratio trade from that or whatever it may be. So you, you can kind of lean on both, right? So do an audit. What are you good at? What are you not good at? And you need to be, you know, it's where you look at yourself in the mirror and go, you know, what? I'm not that good at anything. I'm not. But that's okay because what you've got to do is take stock of where you are because where you are now does not equal where you're going to be in the future. You can still say, take, uh, you know, there was, I did a video uh, and on the YouTube channel about the uh, uh, Stockdale paradox. And this is exactly that. It just comes to mind now. It's like, okay, I'm going to go and check out that out because I did a bit more detail there. And I'm just kind of remember from memory what kind of the nuances. But ultimately, what it effectively means for trading is this. You need to be absolutely, absolutely brutally honest about your current situation in trading, but still be absolutely incredibly optimistic about the future. Very, very briefly, Stockdale was um, prisoner of war. And, you know, he was being treated horribly. I think I mentioned this before. He was being treated horribly. I'm almost dwell on that. Treating horribly. So he had to reflect on his situation and go, hey, it's not great. I'm shackled. I'm chained. I'm being beaten. I'm being starved. But I still believe I'm going to get out. And, he, and, and from a training perspective, I know this is a really horrible kind of thing to think about and, and put with training. But let's, let's, let's tone it down a touch and say, well, you have to audit effectively and honestly and say, hey, be honest with yourself. Where are you now? You're not so great. That's fine. But look back on your old trades. And then you can go, actually, you know what? Maybe I am quite good at cutting the losers. Maybe I'm quite good at spotting that momentum. Maybe I'm quite good at finding that flush candle. You know, what can I get better at? You know, I really enjoy buying those flushes. I really enjoy being the person who buys that low. It's not really working for me because I'm muddled up with other sorts of trades and it's, it's a bit of a mess, but that's something to build on, right? That's something I can get better at. And if I knew, let's say, okay, well, if there was a new balloon, and there was a flush cap. Okay, no, okay, that, that, that's feasible. So it's going back and it's saying, what am I good at and what am I not so good at? And often I tell it, talk about this, but I, honestly, it's something that I think is missing from many traders' playbook. I think it's it's something that's very easy to do. It's very simple to do. And it's something that many traders don't do. And if we go back to kind of the, the very beginning, one of the very beginning slides, it's doing something that others aren't doing. You know, how many traders 
are going back and are analyzing their trades and saying, what am I good at? What could I build on? What was what, what, something, a little seed of something I could water and become greater? And what's really not working for me? And then that's where you kind of say, well, that's my skill edge. So now we want to combine the skill and observation, okay? So imagine we've got the fading price spikes, okay? So you say, right, I'm good at, you know, some of you are good at this. Some of you are literally watching this going, yeah, that's me. I'm good at, you know, I, I watch it when a price moves and I can see that kind of momentum. I can see that volume spike. I can see that big bar range. I can see the stall and I hit it and I'm very, often I get the high or I get the low and I'm really good at that. And you might be sitting there saying, that's me. And maybe it's a different pattern to you. So how do you exploit that? And how do you say, okay, I'm going to put this skill and this observation together. So let's say you're good at trading price spikes. And that might not be enough on its own because, you know, let's be honest, sometimes you get it, maybe it goes back against you, maybe you're holding it, your risk management's not that great, your discipline's not that great. And even though you might be getting that high tick very often, you're not holding it long enough to, to, to uh, put it into uh, for it to, the trade to come into fruition is the word I'm looking for. You, you're kind of missing all the other structure. And so you you have to get better at that, but then you maybe you combine it with an observational edge and you go, okay, listen, I've observed there's a potential momentum move or turning point. And what I'm going to do is combine that with the skill edge. So what I what I kind of mean by this is, you know, let, let's you let's use a, a kind of real world example here and say, okay, um, I know, and I'm going to show you a kind of trade example from the other day. And I posted this actually on the in the community in Traders Mastermind. I thought, great, let's share it with you guys as well. Because it's it, it is a different context to it here than it was there, but it, it it's really perfect for this. So I know the odds of hitting an overnight high in the US today, the Dow, is during the regular trading hour session, i.e. when the bell goes for my time it is two thirty, is it's very high, right? I know that the odds are hit very high. And I've observed that and I've the stats that back that up. I also know that, you know, I've observed that the odds of a continuation after momentum move is high. If you've got the right momentum, this is the kind of, okay, we're leading mid to TA here a little bit, but we're kind of saying, okay, when there's good momentum, there's strong momentum, very often it continues under the right conditions. I also know that when the tick index is persistently high, a pullback is a good buying opportunity. Now, the tick index is the New York Stock Exchange tick index, and I am going to do a webinar exclusively on this. It's not an indicator. It's an actual index that you get from New York Stock Exchange. So you can get it on TradingView. I'm sure other platforms get it and you can analyze it and show you structure and then you can trade you know, via CFD or via spread or, or, or through TradingView trading, uh, on Pepperstone. So I'm going to go into more depth on that. So I'm not going to kind of digress too much, but I've noticed that this is something, again, not many people are watching this type of stuff. When it's persistently high, pullback in that is a good buying opportunity. I also know that the quick price spikes in tick, like when that suddenly rockets up and it's basically showing that a lot of people are suddenly buying a lot of New York Stock Exchange stocks. Effectively, what it's doing is how many people are buying, how many people are selling and netting those off. That's roughly, but like I say, I'm going to go into some depth in that. So you make sure you're on the, on the list, on the Pepperstone email list and my email list, because we'll tell you when this one's coming. I don't know when, but I, I want to do something about it because I think it's really, really valuable, especially for a day trader. So I know this, I've observed this, I've seen this, I've traded off this thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times. You know, it's, it's a bread and butter type thing for me. And I'm also consider myself pretty good at quick exits into flushes. I'm pretty good at reading the flush. I'm pretty good at reading the price. I'm pretty good at reading out supply demand imbalance on a very short-term basis. And I want to try to add them together now, okay? And so this, this is where we um, keep rolling the wrong thing in the mouse. This is where we kind of combine these together. And I say, okay, listen, We've we've got the overnight low here. We've got the overnight high. Let me go straight to this one. We get the drive up, okay? So I'm saying we've got this is the overnight high. We're holding above it. Fine. That trade not not involved in it. Wasn't involved in this long because it's not not a trade I'm looking for. But we're getting this persistent high tick reading. We pull back, and again, this might not mean much to you, but we're kind of using this as an example. We get a pullback, and I know that a pullback in ticks after persistently high tick reading is something that often results in one more flush to the high side tick that's an observational edge i also know that general technical analysis says after a good momentum drive we often push higher especially if we've got support above a recent decent high which is the overnight high there that was the white line you can see there and i also know that when we get a flush in ticks the high side very often it's a short-term top flush in ticks the low side short-term bottom so this was a good trade in that we got the pull back here after persistently high ticks exit out into there it was, it's not going to be such a humongous trade, but it's a 50 tick trade. 
you know, it's a 50 tick trade, which is something that maybe people don't observe. Maybe people don't observe the ticks. Maybe people don't observe how price responds to this. And this isn't a time of day thing specifically, but it's something that's very recent. I thought, hey, this is a great thing to, to kind of show. So, um, again, yeah, we'll definitely go into more detail on ticks because I love the. I, I, Honestly, it's one of my favorite tools, and it kind of comes in and out. Sometimes in the market, it's not very volatile. It's it's not that great. I'll be honest with you, and you just discard it. But when you've got volatility and you've got you know sensitivity to price, it's a real juicy little little index. And it's funny. So I don't know why more people don't look at it. Anyway, for a later date, edges won't last. Edges come and go. You know, this algo kicking in at eight o'clock. It might run for ten days and stop. But your job is to capitalize on it while it's there and to spot it and say, hey, I've spotted this guy moving. I've spotted the way that this, this market responds to this. The rhythm of the market is going to change, right? And when the crowd knows, the edge goes, as I saying. When the crowd knows, the edge goes. That noon balloon very yeah, it happens from time to time, but it's not as prevalent as it was back when we had you know, big prop firms in the U.S., just piling as much money into it as possible and, and teaching these guys how to take advantage of these literal one or two patterns that were occurring right now. And the good prop firms, and what you should do as a good trader is constantly evolve, right? You should constantly say, hey, this is working, capitalize on it, capitalize on it, capitalize on it. It's not working anymore, stop. Just like Pitbull was doing page whatever it was, 91, capitalize on this. A very, very simple edge. And you often you read guys, market wizards and all sorts of stuff, they capitalize on something they spotted and then they make a lot of money doing that. I'm not saying you, you're going to do that, but that's something that if you're in the right place at the right time with the right skill set in the right environment, something just goes, ding, this is, this is something I've got to take. But you're never, the, the, this is the kind of emphasis I want to place is you never get into a position where you can spot those if you don't allow yourself. If you're constantly looking for other thing that everyone else is looking for, you're just going to be missing. It's sitting right in front of you. Whereas if you're saying, hey, let me step back a bit, let me observe, let me go, actually, you know, that's an interesting pattern. Let me keep an eye out for that. Let me keep an eye out for this. Let me watch that. How does it respond to this? And be inquisitive about things. Then you might spot something that no one else has spotted. Like, hey, whoa, whoa, hang on. After we have this, this, and this, we very often get this. Let me go back and you get excited and you go back and you look and you go, we've had it there. We've had it there. We've had it there. We've had it there. Right, I've got something here. How do I turn that into a trade idea? So your job is to keep observing, keep making notes, play that inquisitive detective game. At the same time, don't discard all the other stuff. You absolutely must have the psychology because if you've got the edge and it, you're not executing right, you're going to mess it up. You're going to screw it up, right? So work on the psychology side of stuff. Work on the emotional side of things. Work on running your trades because, you know, how many times, right, have – and you've probably done this. I know I've done this. We've We've had something that's a great signal, and we just don't take it. For whatever reason. Now, obviously, as you get more seasoned in the market, you're going to take your signals because you know that, hey, I put my hand in that fire way too many times and I keep getting burnt. Let's not do this. But you've been in a case where you've had a signal and you've not pulled the trigger. And that's a psychology issue. So even if you've got this great edge, you're like, hey, you, you can still convince yourself not to take the damn thing. Like, if it's worked and it's got a great risk reward ratio, it's got this and I've spotted this and I've spotted this pattern and you still don't take it, it's like, well, that's a psychology issue. So you still should work on the psychology. Still should work on being able to maximize, you know, running the trades and trading bigger on the best plays and managing risk. But I, you know, just want to, you know, just emphasize that if you carve your own edge and play your own game, and I know we've kind of, you know, overview of all different stuff here and uh, given an idea of maybe things to look at, but that's the beauty of trading is, you know, and that's why you're here is, okay, I want to think differently. I want to take this to the next level. I want to... You know, just just break out from the crowd and 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 observe the crowd and and find things that other people don't find and see opportunities that they don't and maybe they work maybe they don't but if I find one that really works and it works continuously maybe you you trade aggressive on that and you risk the the, the capital you made on the last one and you go more and then you go more and you go hey I'm going to run this and see how much I can get out of it and who knows where it could go maybe it doesn't work maybe it gets stopped out but the point is it's always observing it's playing the detective game it's being it's being smart and it's it's looking for stuff that other people aren't looking for. Um, okay, guys, and there's a few questions I'll get to in a moment. Um, thank you for those dropping in. If you want to drop them in, do so. We've got a few minutes left. If you go to tradersmastermind.com forward slash trade checklist, you get a copy of the trade checklist that I use before each trade. And I've got a copy of the slides for you. I know many of you like a copy of the slides just to have, download and look at your, uh, your own leisure. So those are there for you. Uh, who have we got here? Kindly define the term trading edge. Well, uh, Peter, 
that to me, like I say, I think the trading edge is your combination of a skill that you've got that you're better at than others. Okay, that might be tape reading, that might be um, your ability to run trades harder uh, or further, be more aggressive on trades that you're winning. You know, there's there's um, you know, traders out there, skill visualization, there's traders out there who have got videos and, and stuff who have shared that they weren't actually that much more effective at picking the right trades, but their edge was being very aggressive in the right place. Now that be like, well, well, that's how they that's how they did so well. So there's a skill edge, which is that, and then the observation edge of, hey, I've also noticed that this happens in this market or this pattern works very effectively. And so when you combine those two, to me, that's trading edge. You know, other people define it differently and stuff like this, but can you really, here's a question for you, can you really honestly say that you've got a trading edge by trading, uh, you know, a, a generic pattern or trading with, the you probably can't, right? Although, I would say well, I spoke to John Bollinger at the Pepperstone event. He trades with Bollinger bands, obviously, and he has got an edge there because he understands when to use them. He understands this, so that you know he's gone deep into something and he created the damn thing slightly different. But for us, it's like okay, how can I become very, very good and very, very uh, different about approaching the thing? All right, so thank you, uh, Peter. All right, Tom here. As a new trader, I'm just coming other screen by the way. As a new trader, very humble, very willing to learn, improve. Given my office coming from zero, knowing a lot about charts indicators, I'm persisting with a Williams fractal strategy on a five-minute chart and following my rules on the T, but getting hammered. Magnetic curve is slowly sinking and sinking. How long would you persist with the strategy before throwing the tiling and trying something else? Um, so the, with the question is, I, I was very quick there, how long should you persist with the strategy before throwing the toweling and trying something else? Uh, my thought on this, Tom, is that if you are feeling like that now, then you should stop that now. Because you won't have to, you, you're probably in this situation now, Tom, and we've all been here, right? You, you, you kind of must stick with this strategy. I've got this. I must stick with it. I must stick with it. But when the trade starts, you want to trade it starts to work, you don't have confidence that that's going to work and hit the target. So you snatch at profits and you kind of then trade it in a really unconfident manner. You get frustrated by it. You, you're like, oh, man, I can't, you know, I can't, you don't believe in the strategy. You know, unlike something that maybe you believe in, you're like, okay, it's not working, but I know that it's going to work because I'm, I've, I've, I've observed this happening before. Or, you know, it's, I think if you are slowly, if your equity curve is slowly sinking and sinking, um, stop trading that. Wipe the slate clean. Spend some time going back and looking at your trades and saying, hey, okay, what was good about those trades? What was effective? What worked well? How did I work well? How didn't I work well? Because you might find that you weren't following it to the letter. Maybe you found you did say disciplines on point, but maybe you will find that you know you're missing some of the trades. Maybe you find you're closing trades early, and those kind of trades you're closing early are the ones that actually go on and make up for the losses. You know, there's all sorts of things there, but it's that you know you've got a sounds like you've got a good chunk of data, right? You've got a really good chunk of data. Your job. And something that I would do, and I really recommend doing this, is to literally pause what you're doing, go back and do a big review. Pick out 10% best trades, 10% worst trades, or days, or however you want to structure it. And look at the commonality between those top 10% and say, what, what, what was about those days that made it work really well for me? Was it a specific day type? Was it a way I traded? Was it a way I position size? Was it a way I managed risk? Okay, put that in a pile, and then go to your worst 10% and go, whoa. They're pretty awful. What was the commonality between them? Was I adding to trades? Was I impul impulsively trading? Or was I trading with the letter, but the type of day was just wrong? Was it? What was it? And and start there because it can be overwhelming. If you've got loads of trade. Discard the middle for now, and then say, right, how can I do more of what worked well? And it might be a strategy thing. You might say, hey, listen, this strategy works well, but only under these conditions. Hmm. Okay, it works really well on this range bound conditions. How do I identify a range? Well, actually, day after trend day, that's often a range day before uh, you know, a key Fed meeting or CPI number, that's often a range. You you can come up with these things and then you can reverse engineer, <coughs> excuse me, how to trade in a range. So long, long-winded way of saying go back and review. I would, you know, if it was me and it wasn't working, you're feeling that way about it, and you know, you're you're kind of saying, Hey, I I'm getting hammered and it's, it's did you do say you're following the rules to the T to be fair, but if that's the case, I would, you know, because even if it might be a strategy, this is the other thing. Tom, I'm gonna to get to the other questions in a minute, guys. Just um, bear with me a sec. But you know, the thing is, Tom, is this is it 
you might have a strategy that's very effective under certain conditions, but not effective on the others. And you're following this now and you're just feeling so disheartened and frustrated by it. And it's not the, it's not the strategy for you because even if, you know, let's say the end of the year, it kind of picks up, are you going to follow it all the way through and just have a good December? You're probably not. So even if it is a profitable strategy over time, it might not be the one that suits your personality. You maybe want one that's a bit more consistently. Maybe the numbers aren't as big growth wise, but the consistency is more important to you. So, I would take a step back and, and reflect a little bit. Um, why are these so quite these small? These questions I can't see them as well as I'd like. I'll work with what I've got. Uh, okay, Angela, as a new beginner trader, what would you advise is the best way to study the market in order to find my trading edge? Watching the live market or back testing? Uh, it's a good question, actually. I would watch the market live where you can. You might not have time to watch the market all the time. I really wouldn't. I would watch the open. I'd watch how the market responds at key levels. Uh, like the prior days high, prior days low, if you can. Again, maybe the closing hour, maybe the hour responds. You know, some of the key points in time. But one of the things you can do is, you know, print off your chart. Um, or what I do is I kind of screenshot it and put it onto an iPad and I get Apple Pencil and I go, right. And I, and I just study and I just look and just keep the time frame the same, five minute, 15 minute daily for whatever you're trading. And just look at it and say, hey, what do we do this sort of time? What do we do that? And And, and that helps you. When you don't have the burden of having to perform, i.e. in a trading day, you don't have the burden of being of having to make a winning trade or look for a winning trade, and you're there and you're relaxed and you're kind of, you know, you're at your desk, your lamp on, you know, maybe you've got some calm music, the screens are off, and you've just got that in front of you, whether you print it out, or whatever it may be, you can kind of see some patterns. And I think that's a really good way. You're in a really good position now, Angela, in that you don't have ingrained some of the bad habits that many traders have. If you're a beginner trader, then you know studying that market and, and and working out what you think you could be good at do you like trading with the trend or do you have a more propensity to fade the trend and, and kind of going with that for a bit and then just picking out a strategy running it for a bit utilize the demo do that type of stuff but you know going back to the, the question observing if you can putting the screen time in but also doing that markup on charts i think is is valuable um Karim says, thank you and how to watch this again. If you are on, uh, which you will be, you're on Pepperstone's email list, because sent you this, they will send you a link to the recording, Karim. And if you want a copy of the slides, which won't get sent to you automatically, then you can go to uh, tradesmastermind.com forward slash trade checklist. Uh, here's the buddy, here's the man himself, Hip. Bolito, this man is, uh, you can check him out, guys. Sometimes he does calls in Trades Mastermind. He is saying, uh, best way to learn a completely new edge, repetition. He knows it. That's it. You've got to repeat, 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 repeat. Um, Hip does a lot of tape reading, actually. Hips, I'd say he's one of the, you know, one of the best tape readers out there. And that's looking at short term movement in price and structure and on the order book and that type of thing. And it just you know, learning and, and it'll, it'll say the same thing. And it's just repeating and watching and observing how price responds to key levels, you know, blast through. Hey, but hang on a second. We've immediately come back down again. I've got big offers stacked up. I'm not saying you should look at the order book and that's something you should go down, but it's that repetition and, and uh, observation. Um, uh, Tom says thank you. Angela says thank you. I think this is we've got everyone. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, hey Mark, I'm really good at whole levels, key numbers, but why is CFD spread betting it different than futures? Uh, I think that's a question you're asking about. Why are the why's the price different? So a we've got the index right very quickly. This they've got the index, which let's say is the Dow, which is made up of the constituents of the 30 stocks in the Dow, right? And then and there's a formula applied to that, and that's the Dow. But we can't actually in theory trade that. That's an index, it's just literally a valuation that is done, aggregated all these numbers and they're weighted for different things, different prices and stuff. Forget about the weighting, but it's a formula applied to these 30 stocks, and that's the index. Okay, so to trade that in the in the uh uh, via you know, the the market, if you like, the way to do that would be to trade futures. And people go in, but the problem with futures is that they have to expire at a certain date. So you're basically the, the price is different because the futures contract formula is based on the underlying, which is the index, plus it's got other things in the time to expiry, uh, the interest rate. It's got a very. I'm not going to the kind of the, the, the make it too complicated, but. It's a completely different formula. So the futures price is different from the index. Now, Pepperstone 
make it easy for you and say, hey, we have a product, whether it's a CFD or spread bet, it's a synthetic product that we create, but for all intents and purposes, it's tracking the DAO. And so you can see the price, and it's going to be relatively similar to the DAO, but it's going to be different to the futures because it's a product that makes it easy to understand. It kind of doesn't expire unless, unless you kind of close it. It's just a different way of doing it. So the pattern will be exactly the same. If you look at the pattern, it will be exactly the same. And I would say you say you're look, uh, trading uh, a whole level's key numbers. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the whole numbers and the big levels like that. You've got to be careful if you're looking at the futures because, you know, if the index stayed exactly where it was and the futures contract would slowly change price as it aligned itself with the index at expiry. So it would then, because the time to expire is different. So even if the index was stay, you know, was sitting there staying at 31,000, didn't move in at the tick, the actual futures contract would slowly, slowly come back into line and come back you know, into line with the index. Whereas if you're trading you know, a Pepperstone product like the CFD or the spread bet, uh, US 30, that would just stay very, very exactly where it was as well. So if you're trading whole numbers and stuff, then I would use the CFD or the Dow Cash. And personally, I wouldn't necessarily use the futures. I'm being general there because if you're trading intraday, you could probably still, there's still going to be some supply demand imbalance, maybe at some of these whole numbers, especially if you're trading crude. Um, you know, if you're trading, you know, Dow or, or, or NASDAQ, you may get that. But I think generally speaking, as a generalization, it's looking at the chart of the instrument uh, you trade in. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thanks. Uh, enjoyed it. Take care, guys. See you next one. Bye bye. Thank you.